Hello, my name is Kristen Watson. I'm an associate professor at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy and one of the members of the Atrium Cardiology Collaborative. Thank you for joining us for this presentation entitled Playing the Oldies Book Goodies to Manage Patients with Treatment-Resistant Hypertension. Before we get started, let's, dig, let's define what treatment-resistant hypertension is. There's two widely accepted definitions. The first is being uncontrolled treatment-resistant hypertension. And this is patients who have a blood pressure above goal and are receiving three or more treatment options for their hypertension. And that's preferably including a diuretic as part of that regimen. Just remember when considering diuretic as part of a treatment plan for a patient with hypertension, we should be really focusing on the use of the thiazide type diuretics such as chlorthalidone and endapamide as they have been shown to be more effective than our thiazide diuretics like HCTZ in controlling blood pressure. Controlled treatment-resistant hypertension is when the blood pressure is at goal for the patient and there are four or more medications. As you can see here, the treatment, the incidence of treatment-resistant hypertension has increased over the past two decades. So what's the reason for this? One is that we have better detection rates of treatment-resistant hypertension, but the other is that we have a growing rate of um, the aging population, as well as obesity, which are two of the strongest predictors of developing treatment-resistant hypertension, and we'll discuss other risk factors in a few minutes. So what are our top hits or treatment options for treatment-resistant hypertension? Before I get go through this, just for those of you who may, be not use, may not be familiar with vinyl records or tapes, the A side of the record would really be the top hits um, on the album, whereas your B side, where your least favorable or, or, or songs that would not make it to the top of the charts. When we're considering the treatment of hypertension, our three core medications that we want to go, classes of medications that we want to exhaust first, include the use of either an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. We also will use a calcium channel blocker and a thiazide like or thiazide diuretic. These medications should be part of that treatment regimen for all patients with hypertension before adding additional therapy unless contraindications exist. And I refer you to the 8th National Joint Committee on Blood Pressure Guidelines to discuss which, which will overview for you how you decide between choosing one, one agent over another as your first therapy. So our learning objectives for today are to be able to discuss the place and therapy of our old, some of our oldies but goodies including spironolactone, hydralazine, clonidine, and the alpha antagonist in the management of treatment-resistant hypertension. And we'll also go through a brief case and develop a pharmacological plan for a patient with treatment-resistant hypertension. Before you add another track or another medication to a patient who is deemed to have treatment-resistant hypertension, you really need to conduct a thorough assessment. A large portion of patients will have pseudo-resistance and we need to dig deep to determine if there's something else impacting their blood pressure or determine if that blood pressure we're evaluating is really real. The first is adherence to medications and also diet, such as adhering to a low sodium diet. Non-adherence to medications can attribute to up to 50% of cases of patients who are deemed treatment resistant hypertension. White, white coat phenomenon, we all hear that term, so patients having a higher blood pressure when they're off in the office than what would be observed at home, in their home or natural setting. White coat phenomenon can account anywhere from 20 to 30% of patients who are deemed to have treatment resistant hypertension. In order to determine if someone has white coat syndrome or white coat phenomenon is to do, use an ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring. And there's been a huge shift in push in practice to really switch to, to using ambulatory blood pressure monitoring when available through the practice site, or if not having the patient monitor their blood pressure at home using their own cuff to see what their blood pressure is. This is much more helpful in diagnosing hypertension and also determining when additional treatment options are, meet, are, are needed. We hope to see more of this practice moving forward as the use of ambulatory care blood pressure monitoring has really been observed to be the best practice for patients. Drug-induced causes of hypertension are possible, but this only accounts for about two to 4% of cases of treatment-resistant hypertension. 
and this includes things such as the use of oral contraceptive therapies. Obstructive sleep apnea can be very present in patients who have prevalent among patients who have treatment resistant hypertension. So patients with risk factors should be evaluated for obstructive sleep apnea and treat it. Or patients also who have signs of obstructive sleep apnea should also be evaluated and treated. Yet I've seen plenty of patients, once we have them treated for obstructive sleep apnea, we can see, see dramatic reductions in blood pressure in those patients. And then we have an, a few other rare causes such as primary aldosteronism and renal artery stenosis which can lead to treatment resistant hypertension. So let's talk about the who and the why. So our at risk groups for treatment resistant hypertension include those who are increasing age, so our elderly patient population, and patients who are obese. Other risk factors, and probably ones that we commonly see among patients with treatment-resistant hypertension, is these patients often also have chronic kidney disease or diabetes. So what's the pathophysiology behind treatment-resistant hypertension? So these are patients who have a normal cardiac output, but they have an increase in systemic vascular resistance and plasma volume. It's also well established that patients with treatment-resistant hypertension have a degree of plasma aldosterone level elevation and suppression of renin. So let's talk a little bit more about aldosterone and if the mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists are the answer for treating treatment-resistant hypertension. So let's briefly go through the role of aldosterone in our body. So it has three different parts of our system that will affect. Within the renal system, we see sodium and water retention, an increase in extravascular volume. Aldosterone can also cause tubular damage and sclerosis in the renal tubule system, leading to microalbuminuria. It's well documented that in the cardiac system, we see vascular damage, remodeling, hypertrophy, and, and potentially associated with an increased risk of arrhythmias. And we know that the use of an aldosterone antagonist, spironolactone or plerinone, in those with heart failure has been shown to have re dramatic reductions in events. Aldosterone also has effects within the vasculature, including increase in arterial stiffness, vasoconstriction, and endothelial dysfunction. Because of this, the known facts of aldosterone and then aldosterone levels tend to be elevated in those patients with treatment-resistant hypertension. The use of spironolactone and aplerinone have been explored. There's a wealth of data, uh, the, there's data supporting the use of spironolactone through placebo controlled trials in which significant reductions in blood pressure have been observe, observed when this was added on as additional therapy. However, there was not, no real great data comparing spironolactone to other agents for treatment resistant hypertension and how they compare in blood pressure lowering effects. So along came the PATHWAY trial, which was published in Lancet in 2015. And in this trial, patients went through cycles, and each cycle was 12 weeks in duration. At the beginning of each cycle, they received the lowest dose of therapy, and then after six weeks, if tolerated, their dose was titrated up. Patients each cycle, as I mentioned, was 12 weeks long, and there were the four cycles. So all patients received spironolactone for one cycle, bisoprolol, doxazosin, or placebo. The order of their cycles were randomized. 322 patients were enrolled and 230 received all of the four treatments. Notable exclusion are listed here for you, including those patients with an estimated GFR less than 45, patients with a recent cardio or cerebral vascular event. In this study, spironolactone was associated with improved blood pressure reduction compared to other therapies in placebo. There was about a nine millimeter of mercury difference improvement in systolic blood pressure compared to placebo, and a, a little over a four millimeter mercury of improvement in blood pressure compared to the other two active agents. The risk of side effects was very low in this trial 2% of patients who received spironolactone had a one-time incidence of a, serum, of a serum potassium level greater than six. So the take-home point, and I think really supported what a lot of us have already been doing in practice, is that spironolactone is a dose of 25 to 50 milligrams, a study in the PATHWAY-2 trial, 
really should be our fourth line agent for blood pressure reduction in the general population. One thing that we need to think about is the safety of this therapy. As we well know from the heart failure literature, that after the quick uptake with the use of aldosterone antagonists in patients with heart failure, there was also a dramatic rise in the risk of hyperkalemia and associated consequences. So how do we identify which patients are at higher risk for hyperkalemia? We know that those patients with diabetes, renal disease, increased age, and the use of non steroidal anti-inflammatories will increase your risk of developing hyperkalemia. When a patient has renal disease present, we want to make, we should start with the lower dose of therapy and we titrate that therapy up. The nice thing compared with treatment of hypertension, so as opposed to doses that we may use in somebody with advanced liver disease, is that we're using much lower doses, only that 25 to 50 milligrams. But if you have a patient in the pathway two trial, patients with an EGFR of less than 45 were excluded. So we can't really extrapolate the safety of that trial to maybe somebody with more advanced renal disease. I never think it hurts to start with a lower dose if somebody has a potassium on the higher side or if they have some degree of renal impairment or advanced age. In the pathway two trial, they saw about a 0.45 milli 0.45 milli equivalent rise in, hyper, in potassium levels in those patients who receive spironolactone. So you want to make sure you look at renal function and baseline potassium when starting therapy. The use of a, one, a spironolactone or plerinone is not well established for the treatment of resistant hypertension in those with hemodialysis or stage 3 or 4 kidney disease. And I think no matter when we're using one of these agents, monitoring is really prudent. Especially when we're thinking about treatment-resistant hypertension, one of the groups that this will be elevated in are those with diabetes and renal impairment. So developing, if you're using this, a nice, a nice process in when you'll be bringing people back in. If you're adding it on to therapy, I think bringing somebody back in in two to four weeks to reassess their potassium level is a great idea. So now we know that we have our three core drug regimen who patients who can take it with an ACE or an ARB, an ACE inhibitor and ARB, a calcium channel blocker, a thiazide type diuretic, and then add on an aldosterone antagonist barring renal function and potassium are okay. We need to think about what are our other options because we are gonna have patients who are not gonna be able to take an aldosterone antagonist. We also are gonna have patients who are gonna require more than four medications. So after we did our thorough assessment of patients and determined there was no pseudo resistance or other causes of their resistant hypertension, what other agents do we consider or put on that B side? So here's a list of agents and we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of each of these agents. So first is Alaskirin or Tecturna. One thing that we need to recall in this, with this a agent is that we would not use it in patients with diabetes and kidney disease who are also receiving an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker because these patients are at higher risk of developing hyperkalemia. We also want to think about, especially too, even if somebody wouldn't have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, and we already have them on an ACE inhibitor and spironolactone, it would not be prudent to add aliskirin because there would be an elevated risk of hyperkalemia. Meclomidolamine is a ganglion inhibitor that was recently approved for use as Beclomil. This agent is very effective at lowering blood pressure. It is not indicated for use in those with significant atherosclerosis or cerebral arterial disease because of its pronounced blood pressure lowering effects. Its side effects are heightened in those with renal disease and can be a pretty cumbersome regimen. Starting off with therapy 2.5 milligrams twice, three times a day. Patients also need to adhere to using the same, the bioavailability is affected by food, so they need to be consistent in taking this medication with or without food. And that sodium restriction is not recommended when therapy is employed because you will have a more pronounced effect in blood pressure lowering. Methyl dopa is a great option in, uh, to consider in somebody who has pregnancy, who is pregnant and has hypertension. In the pregnant population and in general, this medication may not be well tolerated because of anticholinergic side effects. Um, its blood pressure lowering effect is not as 
blood pressure lowering effects are not as significant as some of our other antihypertensives. So we really avoid using this medication until we be posed with a pregnant female who has treatment, who has hypertension. So what other options are there? So loop diuretic therapy may be an option for patients with advanced renal disease instead of a thiazide or thiazide type diuretic. And these are gonna be patients who have evidence of edema um, or other patients who may have volume overload from a condition. One thing to recall that loop diuretic therapy to see its antihypertensive effects is that you are going to have to use it, an agent like furosemide twice a day to have a continual effect throughout the day. Minoxidil is a very effective medication in lowering blood pressure. However, I like to say when you're adding minoxidil, you're giving them at least two medications. So this is because one, minoxidil causes edema, so patients will be required to have diuretic therapy in addition to minoxidil. Edema can be present in up to 80% of patients who receive minoxidil. Minoxidil, because of its potent vasodilatory effects, will also produce a reflex tachycardia Necessitate, often necessitating the use of beta blocker therapy. Other serious side effects occur include the use of include pericardial effusions. So because of these side effects and the need to have to use other medications in combination with minoxidil, we really try to avoid the use of this agent. Beta blocker therapy, for those of you who have been in practice sometimes, you have seen the evolution of beta blocker being part of our first line therapies for hypertension to not be included in that first line therapy. And this is because beta blockers are not as effective in lowering blood pressures as other agents, and they don't have, as part of first line therapy, don't have the reduction in clinical outcomes compared to other agents. So where do I think beta blockers fit in? I think they really fit in in those patients who have compelling indications, such as those as heart failure, coronary disease, and arrhythmias. And one thing, when you look at the heart failure literature, the addition of beta blocker therapy, for the most part, you see no change in blood pressure over time. And I'll refer you back to the heart failure pathophysiology to understand that a little bit more. What are our other options? Hydralazine, again, is a really great agent in reducing blood pressure. Its big downside, in my opinion, is that it's a three times a day medication. But I think if you need to use it, It's something you need to just talk to your patients about what's the benefit of lowering their blood pressure and why you need to give the medication three times a day. Its side effect profile is pretty benign. Patients will develop, can potentially develop a headache headache with starting therapy. There is though that risk of lupus-like reaction, although it is rare, and we would monitor for that. Clonidine, again, is an excellent agent in reducing blood pressure. Its use is, it is a three times a day medication, but there is a transdermal patch that is available for patients. The, its use is sometimes limited, um, especially in the elderly because of the side effect profile, such as CNS depression with that. Um, and clonidine, remember, can also cause a bradycardia. The alpha antagonist, after results of the all hat trial in which showed that the alpha antagonists were associated with a higher risk of heart failure compared to other first-line options, really have fallen out of favor in treatment of hypertension. I do think that there is a role if you have a male patient with BPH, that this would be a great option to add on who has treatment-resistant hypertension. If you're really killing two birds with one stone. The thing I think we all need to remember is there's that is that risk of orthostatic hypotension and that if to remember to dose our medications at night. So let's briefly review the different agents that we just discussed. So I would not include a direct renin inhibitor as part of my and part of my arsenal for treatment resistant hypertension. One, because the risk of hyperkalemia will go up in our patients with chronic kidney disease who are also receiving an ACE inhibitor or an ARB. And also the combination, regardless if they have chronic kidney disease or diabetes, but if they're in that standard three drug medication with an aldosterone antagonist, I would be very worried about adding this on and that risk of hyperkalemia. Meclomylamine, I would not include on my list for the, what, because of the potent effects of the agent and that the effects are more pronounced in renal disease and the cumbersome um, dosing regimen.
Methyl dopa, as I mentioned, it would be considered an option for a pregnant female if she could tolerate it for treatment, resist, for treatment of hypertension. However, due to its side effect profile and decreased efficacy compared to other agents in reducing blood pressure, I would not have that as part of my next group of agents to add on. Um, in addition to an aldosterone antagonist or if someone couldn't take an aldosterone antagonist. Loop diuretics, if you have a compelling indication for volume overload, would be, would be a nice option to add. Minoxidil, I think, is really towards our last line. It's a very potent agent in lowering blood pressure, but we need to think of its side effects associated with it. Um, and also considering, too, especially in our female patients, that risk of hirsutism. Beta blockers are, can be added on if there's a compelling indication for use. Just recall that you may not see as much of a blood pressure benefit in our pa patients, especially our aging population. So while adding, if you're adding beta blockers on for outcomes, that's great, but just knowing that you may need to add another agent on to get effective blood pressure lowering. And then our last three options I really think should be on our B side. While hydralazine is a three times a day medication, it's well tolerated, but you have to have the right patient who's going to take it three times a day. Clonidine, especially for our younger patients, is generally well tolerated, considering the transdermal patch if there's compliance concerns. And then the use of an alpha agonist in a patient, especially a male patient with BPH, would be an option. So what about outside of our pharmacological strategies? One thing we'll talk about at the end is throughout all of this process is that we, when dealing with medications, is that we really need to be stressing dietary and lifestyle changes with patients. So limiting sodium in the diet, exercise, and weight loss, as they can all have dramatic reductions on blood pressure. The other things that are currently being investigated is what things can we do to the patient to potentially lower their blood pressure in these challenging scenarios. So the first is renal denervation, which is done with a catheter, and that you denervate the renal arteries so that you are lowering that sympathetic activation. The initial trials were very encouraging, and then the simplicity three Three, hypertension 3 trial was published and you did not see any benefit compared to medical therapy. So everyone was very excited about renal denervation. A lot of countries are putting this on their guidelines, but really the results of this trial has really tempered use. There though was recently published the PROG15 trial, which also looked at renal denervation and its blood pressure control was similar to spironolactone and both were added on both were in addition to your standard um, three medication regimen for hypertension so i don't think we're done with renal denervation yet i think we'll see more of that other strategies are ultrasonic sound technology and that's using doing that renal denervation through ultrasound technology and not actually going into the renal system physically to cause that denervation so there's a lot of ongoing research with that, as well as carotid baroreceptor activation. And this is where sensors are pay, placed around the carotids in an attempt to inhibit sympathetic um, reactivation. So with this, there are some safety concerns with this. They, are, they have been changing the different uh, models that they use. So again, you may see more of this in the meantime. So let's go through a patient case. So we have a 74 year old woman who has a systolic blood pressure above 160 for the past three months and a heart rate of 60 beats per minute. Her past medical history includes diabetes, hypertension, and hypothyroidism, making her blood pressure goal less than 140 over 90 because of the presence of diabetes. Her labs are within normal limits and her creatinine clearance is approximately 65 mLs per minute. Her medications include chlorthalidone at 25 milligrams, lisinopril 40 milligrams a day, and philodipine 10 milligrams per day. Secondary causes, including sleep apnea, medication non-adherence, and white coat phenomenon have been ruled out. So before we go thinking about adding that next medication, we wanna make sure that we ruled out those secondary causes as we've done, and we wanna make sure that the patient's on the core three drug regimen, including a thiazide type diuretic, which she is. So I want you to think about which medication you would add next. 
So I would not add clonidine in this patient because she has a heart rate of less than 60 and we would, we would most likely see a further reduction in her heart rate. Doxazosin, I don't think would be appropriate in this scenario as we don't have a male patient with BPH. Hydralazine could definitely be an option for this patient. Um, it, we have to consider that it's a three times a day medication, but it is very effective in lowering blood pressure. If we wanna add a once daily medication, spironolactone, her potassium and her renal function permit the addition of spironolactone. Her, we don't know about her diabetes medications, but her hypertension medications are all once a day. So we could start off there. If that's ineffective, we could then consider adding on hydralazine as another agent for her. So in summary, when, we're approached, when we approach a patient with treatment-resistant hypertension, we wanna make sure we maximize our ACIDE medications so that patients, as long as they don't have contraindications, are in a calcium channel blocker that they are receiving a, and preferably I like to use amlodipine or felodipine, that we have a ACE inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker on board and a thiazide type diuretic. If blood pressure remains above goal, we wanna make sure we assess for pseudoresistance, ensuring that we do ambulatory care blood pressure monitoring or having patients check their blood pressure at home in their own blood pressure cuff and then looking for and assessing medication as adherence. We also want to evaluate for sec other secondary causes as well. If that all pans out, then we, if potassium and serum creatinine are permitting, I would consider the addition of a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist. Spironolactone is just my preference for a reduction in cost. I would reserve a plerinone for patients who would have side effects, such as gynecomastia with spironolactone, or maybe a female who are developing menstrual irregularities and are, that's problematic to them. And then utilize your treatment options based on compelling indications as well. And we wanna think about that as well when we're dealing with treatment resistant hypertension. Are there agents that are known to be beneficial in this specific population? Once we've exhausted those, we wanna think of our other B-side medications. And the agents I would go to first would be hydralazine, and clonidine for patients or an alpha antagonist. And re holding those other agents as last line because of tolerability um, concerns. And I think once you really get past a four drug regimen, it's time to refer the patient to a hypertension specialist. And listed along the right side of your screen, we need to make sure that we're evaluating and maximizing lifestyle changes throughout. I can give you an example of someone very close to me who got an exercise tracker and within six months lost 20 pounds and has come off one blood pressure medication and is getting ready to come off of a second agent. So I think it, we can never stress the importance to our patients, especially when there are concerns with taking so many medications and rightfully so, to make sure we're maximizing those lifestyle changes. However, realizing that sometimes patients are going to be limited in their ability to make some lifestyle changes and sometimes they may have exhausted all them and there's not much improvement that can be made. So we're not done with the story on treatment resistant hypertension. There's a few studies underway. The one is the prevalence of resistant hypertension with direct observed therapy. And this is because of we talked about medication non-adherence is a can play a huge role in treatment resistant hypertension is direct observed therapy and 24 hour ambulatory care blood pressure monitoring. And there's not gonna be any adjustments in medication during this study. There's a new medication that's being evaluated for resistant hypertension. The REHOT study, this is great because it's gonna give us um, comparison of spironolactone one versus one of the agents we consider to be more, one of our more potent antihypertensive therapies. So patients will getting their traditional three medication backbone regimen and will be randomized to spironolactone or clonidine for three months. And then the TRIUM study is really going through a different approach, really stressing those non-pharmacological and lifestyle changes to see um, how that can improve blood pressure goals in patients with treatment resistant hypertension. So thank you for joining us for this presentation today.